Brilliant. Well, if you've got your Bibles uh, with you, if you'd like to turn with me into uh, the book of Mark, carrying on in our uh, series through Mark, coming towards the end. We've been in Mark for, (laughs) it's been a while now. Um, Mark 14, Mark 14, coming towards the end of Mark. There's just so much in here, so much uh, rich truth that we can glean from. And uh, for those of you who were here last time, we were looking at the... uh, the last, uh, the, the Passover, uh, the Lord instituting the Lord's Supper. So these last few chapters of Mark really are very much the, the last moments of the Lord's life and ministry here on the earth, um, before his crucifixion, his resurrection. And uh, we saw last week, uh, or a few weeks back now, the Lord just... Uh, taking this Passover meal with his people and effectively saying all these, all these things, all these uh, uh, symbols within this meal, they all point to him, he said. And then they went out to, the, uh, as we finished off in verse 26, they sang a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. And this is where we arrived this morning in verse 27. And I'm just going to read until verse 42. So verse 27 up until verse 42. <clears throat> Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Jesus said to Peter, Assuredly I say to you, that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently. If I, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. Then they came <clears throat> to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James and John with him. And he began to be, to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. <clears throat> and he went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Let's just pray, shall we? Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would um, speak to us this morning. Lord, that we would see the glory of Christ in this picture here in the garden. Lord, that we would see this one who doesn't sleep or slumber, but this one who intercedes on our behalf, this one who went uh, to the death of the cross. Lord, stir our hearts afresh today. Be with me, Lord. Grant me clarity of thought and speech, liberty and power from on high, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as I just mentioned, we've had this Passover uh, meal uh, where we've seen these, these symbolic uh, pictures of Christ, the breaking of the bread and the drinking from the, the fruit of the vine. Uh, now they head out uh, following this uh, final Passover meal uh, out uh, to the east side of the city over the Kidron Valley across the, the Kidron uh, stream towards the, the west side of the Mount of Olives. There may have been other people doing that also. There were lots of families that would have been in Jerusalem during the time of Passover and they've gone out 
uh, to sleep outside effectively up to the Mount of Olives. This wasn't unusual for them. It was something that they would perhaps do on a regular basis, sleeping under the stars. And we see a conversation that begins to take place en route between Jesus and Peter. Between Jesus and Peter. From verses 27 really for thir- to 31, this is as they're travelling uh, towards uh, Gethsemane. We see this conversation taking place. And then they arrive at Gethsemane. Uh, Gethsemane, uh, the Hebrew word is Gat Shemanim, which means olive press. It means olive press. It would suggest that uh, there was a garden with some olive trees, like an olive grove as such, which was perhaps, um, there were some that think that maybe an olive press was maybe located there in Gethsemane. And we see in our text from verses 32 to 42, um, the Lord engaging uh, with his father in prayer, this deep, this deep prayer, this deep anguish of soul that he goes through. This, one of the greatest battles that we have really in, in human history. Uh, Jesus yielding his life fully over to his father's will while his followers drift off to sleep following their, their big meal and their long walk uh, up to the Mount of Olives. I want us just to consider really three things this morning. Um, the humble uh, humility in our, uh, in our understanding, that we would see the humility of Christ here and we'd compare that humility of Christ really with the, the pridefulness uh, of man, the pridefulness of man. We see firstly the humble wisdom of Christ in our text today. Now Christ the man walked in true humility. He, he always did that which was humble. He was the truly humble man walking amongst us. He had no sinful pride within him. You know, pride lies really deep within the hearts of every human being, really. It's a a tool that the enemy uses. It was the original sin. Satan uh, was found with pride in his his own heart, and, and, and he fell from heaven. And we see mankind being born with this sin nature, having pride within us. But Christ was one conceived supernaturally, conceived of the Holy Spirit of God. He didn't have that sin nature like we do. He didn't have that inward pride, uh, even from his very birth. The perfect model of a, of a humble man, one who walked in humility, one, a man of sorrows who was a, a, acquainted with, with grief, a man who understood humbly. He had a correct perspective of things that were taking place around him. You know, pride can really blur our vision. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But Jesus knew in his humility, he knew the path that he was set on. He knew the, the path that God, his Father, had called him to walk. Now we know in his, in his deity, there's a sense in which Christ knew all things. He, there was a sense in which there was omniscience in his, in his divine nature. We, we see that throughout the Gospels. We see it every now just rear its head. We, we know, remember the paralyzed man that was uh, lowered down through the, the roof? And it says Jesus saw what was in the hearts of these religious leaders. He saw the thoughts and the intentions of their hearts. And even in today's text, we see a sense in which Christ having this supernatural insight into what was taking place. He said, all of you, in verse 27, will be made to stumble because of me this night. All of you will be made to stumble because of me. And then we see in verse 28, again, the Lord having this understanding that his death isn't the end, but there's going to be a resurrection. He says, but after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. This is supernatural insight that he has in his divine nature. And then in verse 30, he speaks to Peter about, even before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you know me. You know, these aren't just kind of things that have been set up, you know, coincidental issues, but it's this, it's this spiritual insight that Christ has, this this one who's fully God and fully man. And we, you know, often people, they will focus on the divine nature of Christ, and rightly so. He's the Son of God, the one from all eternity past. But often his incarnation, the reality that he became a human, is something that which is spoke of a little less frequently. It's, it's, it's discussed a little less um, regularly. And when you think of the, the amazing reality of the incarnation, when you, th- you know, we, we sing the songs at Christmas, don't we? We talk about Jesus uh, uh, being born to Mary and, 
the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary in this, but you think about, here's the, the eternal Son of God that's always existed. He's, he's never begun. He's always been. The, the, the eternity, I mean, we can't even fathom how long eternity is. God the Son has always existed in the triune God of Scripture. And yet 2,000 years ago, this little period of time, here we are looking back 2,000 years, comparatively to eternity, 2,000 years is this small amount of time. 2,000 years ago, this eternal Son of God entered into his own creation as a human being. Fully God, yet fully man. That's an astounding, when you really meditate and ponder on that, that's astounding that God would come into his own creation, he would humble himself and become a man. When we think of the humility of, God, of Christ, the humbleness of Christ, how he came into his creation, and he came not as some king with pomp and, and prestige, uh, riding on a golden chariot, but he came as a, as a small boy in the arms of a young Jewish uh, virgin Mary in a, a relatively unknown place of the world, Bethlehem. Born into, in a sense, into maybe, uh, you know, a not particularly wealthy background. He was a man who experienced pain and grief. He experienced sorrow. He experienced temptation. He was one who walked in fullness of joy. One who walked in complete humility and obedience to his Father's will. You see, we often look at Christ and we, we see him in, in his divine nature and we think that he was... Uh, all these exploits that he did on the earth were all just because he was God the Son. But the reality is that Jesus became a man. He took on human flesh and he walked in the power of the Holy Spirit as a man. He walked as a man, experiencing the same, same temptations as men experience, experiencing the same suffering. If he fell, he would have felt the pain. As he was being nailed to the cross, he would have experienced the pain. But yet he walked as one in the fullness of joy and in the power of the Holy Spirit. He was one who drew his strength from his Father. And we know that he grew in wisdom and stature. He didn't, he didn't just... There's a paradox in Scripture that, in a sense, Jesus knew all things, but yet didn't know all things at the same time. In one sense, he knew all things as God the Son, but in another sense, that, de that deity was kind of veiled and he didn't have all knowledge immediately all time as, as a man we know that he grew in wisdom and stature in Luke chapter 2 it tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men he increased in these things he operated he lived as as a man amongst men but more than man he was one who understood his purpose <clears throat> he understood what he had come to do he understood his father's will in John chapter 12 verses 27 to 33 Jesus says now my soul is troubled and what shall I say father save me from this hour and this is this hour that he's speaking of this hour that has come upon him here in the garden but for this purpose I came to this hour father glorify your name and then it says a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. That's the Father speaking. Therefore the people who stood by heard it and said that it had thundered. And others said an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus said, this voice did not come because of me, but for you, but for your sake. And then Jesus went on in verse 31 of John 12. He says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I... And lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this, uh, he said, this he said, signifying by what death he would die. So what we see here is a picture of Christ knowing the death that he was about to face. Being understand, he had this humble intuition, this humble understanding of what he was about to go through. He quotes from Zechariah chapter 13, And I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. We see this picture here of Jesus being struck, the shepherd being struck and the disciples dispersing and running for their lives. We know um, just earlier when he's dipping the bread into the, into the dish with Judas, he quotes from Psalm 41 about 
his friend lifting up his heel against him. See, Jesus had an understanding of the scriptures. It wasn't just that he was kind of getting these words of knowledge and insight. He, his, his whole, the measure of his whole being was rooted in the word of God and God's, God's revealed will for his life as the one who came to lay his life down at the cross. This was the purpose that he had come for. This was the reason for his hour that he would be lifted up and draw all men unto himself. So we see this supernatural insight, but we see the man Christ Jesus walking in true humility and being aware of his Father's will for his life. And we contrast this really with Peter's brash pride. Peter's brash pride that we see here in our account today. <clears throat> Christ up to this point has been teaching his disciples for over three years now and he's and he said said on regular occasions I'm going to go to the cross I'm going to be crucified I'm going to be raised to life I'm going to be raised on the third day and do you remember when he, he tried to mention this be, before to Peter and Peter was trying to dissuade him from going to the cross and do you remember what Jesus said he said he rebuked him didn't he, he said Satan get behind me Satan get behind me Peter was often one who would brashly step up he was often the spokesman for the disciples stepping up and here you can imagine them splashing their way across the the Kidron stream up towards the slopes of the Mount of Olives mid mid conversation Peter stepping in after Jesus said that the shepherd's going to be going to be struck Peter steps in he says even if all are made to stumble and in the ESV if you're reading from the ESV it says even if all are made to fall away he says yet I will not be I won't stumble if everyone else stumbles and falls away I won't stumble, I will not be. And then Christ effectively brings another rebuke towards him. He says, Peter, by the time the rooster crows twice tonight, you're going to deny three times that you know me. And what, what did Jesus, what, what did Peter do? Did he, did he say, okay, I need to think humbly about this. I need to consider this situation, put it in, in a biblical perspective. No, he didn't. He says that he spoke all the more vehemently. He spoke, he spoke all the more, uh, he came back even with full force. He said, even if I have to die with you, I will, den I will not deny you. And he says they all said likewise. But Peter here is the one really speaking up. He's the, he's the brash one. The one here that we see who perhaps steps in where, where even angels fear to tread, if I can put it like that. He's made a very bold commitment to be a martyr for Christ. Even if I have to die, I'll die with you. He made, this, he made this statement. And here's this one, just within a few short hours, he's going to be running scared for his life. Running scared. Denying the Lord three times that he knew him. We see that in Matthew 26. We see these two servant girls. Two servant girls around the fire. Oh, you were with Jesus. No, no, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Here's this bold, here's this bold disciple that was going to lay his life down for Jesus. Just a few moments later, going out and weeping bitterly over the fact that this prophecy came true, over the fact that this was a reality. You see, what we see here, and I don't want to be too, un un too overly harsh on Peter, because the reality is it's something that we as mankind have to deal with, and that is the pride of our own hearts. We often step up, we often think certain things about the way it is, but actually it's not. We fail. You, know, you see, this is what pride can do. It can blind us from our own condition. It can blind us from our own role in the, in the whole tapestry of God's plan, so to speak. And it can often seem very pious as well. When we talk about pride, we're not just talking about, I mean, yes, it is evil, but we're not talking about, it doesn't always manifest itself in an evil way. This was a very pious thing for Peter to say, I'm, I'm prepared to die with you, Lord. I'm, I'm not, if everybody else falls away, I'm not going to fall away. But it was nothing less or more really than the pride intent. <clears throat> See, pride can skew our perspective. It can, it can take our eyes off of the true hero, Jesus, and it, and it kind of places us in, in, in his place. And you see this th throughout people who when they look at Bible interpretation they see characters in the Bible and we know the, the well-known one of David and Goliath and how like David 
uh, fought Goliath and we place ourselves into the hero role. Well, Goliath is our problem and we're the David and we need to defeat our problem. And we place ourselves into the role that actually belongs to Christ. Christ is the hero in the Christian faith, not you, not me. There's only one hero and it's Christ. And we can get ahead of ourselves. We can, we can have a prideful perspective. We could read ourselves into the story in a way which it's not meant to be. And the problem with pride is we often, we often don't see it. We can't see it. It takes our dependency off of God. It causes us to, to have a, 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 mis, a skewed perspective on who he is and what he's done for us. You see, true humility involves submission to God, to God's authority. Christ is one who came as that perfectly humble man and he submitted himself to his Father's will. He understood that God, his Father, was the one who had the best for him. That he understood that he was called to come and to yield his life and go to the cross he didn't trust in his own understanding as we often do, but the, the, what does the, the, the famous uh, proverb call us? To trust in the Lord with all our heart. Lean not on your own understanding. See, Peter here was leaning on his own understanding. He wasn't trusting in the Lord with all his heart. He, he thought that it was going to happen a different way, that he would lay his life down uh, for Christ at this point in time. When we talk about humility... It's not just about being uh, passive either. It's not just about basically being a walkover, letting everybody just push you around. That's not biblical humility. Biblical humility is not just about being a nice person, being passive. It's about knowing God in a true way and understanding your place under God, that God is the creator. He's the one from whom all power comes and all life comes from him. He's the one who's working, as the Bible tells us, working all things in accordance with his will. He's the one who's working in the hearts of his people to make us more like him, that he would in turn be glorified in a people that, he's, that he has set apart for his own name. True humility is rendered at the cross. We've spoken about this before. When we look to the price that was paid just a few moments after this situation, we see Christ going to the cross and laying down his life. And James 4 tells us that we are called to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. And it's in the sight of Christ, who he is, what he's done for us, that true humility can be rendered. So we're called to be humble with regards to our understanding. We're called to be watchful in our prayers. They arrive at Gethsemane. They've had this conversation. They meet there. He's there with his disciples and he says to them in verse 32, he says, sit here while I pray. Now, the, so he leaves eight of them behind. He takes the inner circle, uh, Peter, James and John. Now, obviously Judas is gone. There's eight that are left. He says, sit here while I pray. And then he takes the others. Verse 34, he says, stay here and watch. And he went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed. He prayed. See, Christ, this, this man, this, this man of humility, he would often take himself away to pray. We see examples of this in the, uh, throughout the life of his ministry. He would often find those places of solitude to seek his father. They'd just finished this big meal. They'd just been on a big walk. Maybe he could have been joining the disciples as they took a little nap. But no, Jesus understood that his first importance was to seek his Father's will. His first priority was to be coming to his Father in prayer. There are some people, some theologians and leaders that have said that if there's one scene in the Bible that they would love to see, if there's one picture that they would love to have witnessed, it would be Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane as he's seeking his Father over what he was about to face. It would be a fearful scene. It would be an awesome scene that we see in Scripture. In verse 33 and 34, he says that he was deeply distressed. His soul was exceedingly sorrowful 
even to death. Often we see the cross, the substitutionary work of Christ on the cross, we see that as the the apex of Christ's atoning work. But here in the garden was where it begun, if I could put it like that. It's where his hour started. It's where the cup of the Father's wrath began to be uh, pressed against the lips of the Saviour, so to speak. Here is this holy and righteous Christ, the one who had never, had never known any sin, never knew what it was to think any evil, to speak in a, a sinful way at all. He was now entering into his hour where this sinless Saviour was about to be made sin. He was about to become sin. That his soul would be given as an offering for sin. And here was his kind of final temptation, so to speak. There would be no going back from this point forward. In verse 41, the Lord says, The hour had now come. The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. There's no going back from this point on. Judas and the soldiers were on their way to take him. And we see that Christ was one who gained his strength not from man but from God his Father. We see that he was strengthened. In Luke 22 it says that an angel came and spoke with him in this garden strengthening him. An angel from heaven came strengthening Christ. You see in the midst of this great trial in the midst of this great wrestle, this great struggle concerning this cup that he was about to drink from Christ knew that he could only be strengthened from God. He could only receive his strength from the Father. Notice in verse 38 when he says, um, he says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. You see, Christ here, he wasn't asking his disciples to pray for him. Jesus wasn't saying, watch and pray for me in case I enter into temptation. But he was saying, watch and And pray lest you enter into temptation. You see Christ wasn't depending upon men. He he didn't have his dependence upon men praying for him. He knew that his dependence was from his father. And that he needed to draw his strength from his father. And he went on to seek his father in prayer. So the question would be, is God your source of strength today? When you're going through trials, temptations, when you're wrestling in certain spiritual matters, who do you go to? Do we go to man or do we go to God? There's a sense in which we as Christians, as, as, as creatures, as human beings, God uses other people to speak through. There's a, there's a sermon here or there or a book here or there or... Uh, leaders of churches or just edifying one another as Christians. God uses one another to speak through, to bring strength and encouragement. But ultimately, do you go to man or do you go to God? You see, Christ here, he didn't go to man. He didn't go to his disciples to back him up. He wasn't seeking their their, um, approval. He wasn't seeking their security. He wasn't saying, get ready guys, I'm going to need you to help me out here because they're about to come and attack me. But he went to his father. He went to his knees in prayer. We need to realize that the power that we need to do what God has called us to do in this life as Christians only can come only from God. It doesn't come from one another. It doesn't come from one sinner just trying to help another sinner. It's good to help one another. It's good to speak the words of life and to pray for one another. But we're praying, ultimately, that God would help that person. When we pray for one another, we're praying that God would come and strengthen that person, that God would come and comfort that person. God is the author of all strength. He's the author of all power. He's the author of all comfort because he's the God of comfort. And Christ knew this reality. Real spiritual growth. If you want the power in your life to overcome sin, if there is sin in your life that you're struggling to deal with, you need the power of God on you. You need God's power to overcome sin. We need, God, we need God's power to resist temptation. We need God's power to grow in Christ-likeness. We need to be a people that are first and foremost going to God 
as our source and strength of our source of strength now again does God put people in our lives yeah even our husbands and wives and spouses and and uh, spiritual leaders but ultimately God is the only one that can provide the spiritual strength and the power to endure and to be victorious in the Christian life there's a lot that people can do if I can maybe as a side note there's a lot that people can do in their own strength aside from the power of God but it would have, it will have no lasting fruit there was a Chinese missionary once um, he came I think it was to the USA um, I, I heard this as an illustration I'm not even sure who it was but he went back to he, he visited various churches and different missions groups in the America he went back to China and they asked him they said what what's it like over there what's it like in America uh, with regards to the spiritual condition of the people of God and he said it's amazing how much can be accomplished without God there without God in it it's amazing how much can be done without God being in it you see I'm not talking about just um, fruitless fleshly works but if you want the power of God in your life in order to bear fruit in order to become more like Christ in order to walk and to put to death the deeds of the flesh by the power of his spirit we need to be a people that first and foremost come to him in prayer that we would seek him in prayer notice here again the Lord's compassion for his people we speak a lot about the compassion of Christ. You see this throughout the book of Mark over and over. And sometimes you can, you can miss these things. In verse 38, it says, it says uh, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Here is the Lord of glory about to face the trial of his life. About to enter into the battle of his, of his life with regards to his soul before his father being poured out as an offering for sin. And he's thinking of the disciples. He says, you need to watch and pray. Less in case you enter into temptation. What a compassionate saviour we have. Even at this moment, he, had a, he would have had every right to have said, guys, I'm going to go and pray over here because what I'm about to face, you guys don't even understand, you don't even comprehend what's going on. But he, he said to them, he even instructed them, you need to be praying, you need to be watchful. He was showing his compassion towards his people. What a saviour we have. The compassion of Christ. He's such a compassionate king. We need to be a people who pray with dependency, drawing our strength from God, but praying in the spirit and not in the flesh. It says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, the, the reference here is not referring uh, to the Holy Spirit, but the, the spirit of the disciples, their, their human spirits. Uh, they desired to faithfully follow Jesus, but as soon as uh, they'd crossed over the, the river, they'd had some food, they were weak in their flesh their flesh was weak they were physically fatigued as the night was now well upon them and this isn't this a very common picture we can often start out with good intentions we get our coffee we sit down to pray and then our eyelids start to droop we start to drift off the flesh becomes weak <clears throat> we're called as God's people to fight the good fight of faith. You know there's something of a striving within the Christian life. If we sit back and we succumb to the flesh, if we're used to just rolling out of bed at any time during the day, we're used to just take it or leave it kind of attitude. You know that, you know that attitude where, oh, tomorrow, I'll sort that out tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be a better day. I know we didn't, I didn't quite get to the Lord today, but tomorrow's the new day. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. You know tomorrow, there's an old expression, tomorrow never comes. We need to be a people who are seeking the Lord today. That we don't succumb to the flesh. But that we, as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, that we discipline our bodies, that we buffet, that we buffet our bodies and bring it into subjection. There needs to be something of a disciplined approach to, to the disciples' life, right? We're disciples of Christ. The word discipline is derived the word disciple derives itself from discipline we're called to be a disciplined people if there's a if there's a particular time where you you feel in in your day that you're going to get get to god and that, that it's a, a fruitful time for you to do that let's discipline ourselves to make it there to make it there may we be disciplined in our devotion life 
We do be di disciplined in our reading of the scriptures, not just to tick a box, but to, to really seek God and to see what he would have us to do, to seek who he is and what his will is for our lives. May we be disciplined in regards to our speech. You know, some people, they're just, they're just, their mouths are just like this kind of constant conduit for what's going on in their head. We haven't got to say everything that is in our minds and our hearts. In fact, sometimes it's wise to hold back. The Bible speaks of putting a guard over our lips. We're called to guard our speech. Here's Peter. We have that perfect example. The Lord is telling them this serious reality that, that the shepherd is going to be struck and the sheep will scatter. And it, again, he's opening his mouth. He's starting to spout things that are just not true, starting to spout things that are just going to come back to haunt him, no doubt, in, in time to come. You know, the Christian life, there's an old expression. Yes, we should be disciplined. Yes, we should be purposeful. Yes, we should buffet our bodies. We should be a people that fast and pray and seek God. That we should make every effort to get to God before the devil gets to us. That we should make every effort to put to death sin. If we're casual about sin in our lives, there's a big problem. If you're indifferent towards the sin that, that, that so easily ensnares us, then there's a big problem. But you know something? There's grace for the Christian. There's the old expression, isn't there, that we're not where we used to be. We're not where we want to be, but we thank God that we're not where we used to be. The Christian life is not one of instantaneous perfection. It's one of spiritual growth. We, we, it's two steps forward and one step back. Two steps forward and one step back. It's like, a, it's like someone going up a, stair, a set of stairs with a yo-yo. The Christian life is up and down, it's up and down, but ultimately there will be a growth, there will be an increase in, the, in, in conformity to the image of Christ. That is what God is doing in the life of the Christian by the power of his spirit. <clears throat> so may we be a people who are praying in a spiritual manner, that we are seeking God in a spiritual way, that we're not succumbed to the deeds of the flesh, that we're not weakened by fleshly ways. May we be a people that pray consistently, that we would be consistent in our prayer. Verse 35, it says that he prayed, and then we see that he returned to his disciples, and he woke them. In verse 37, he woke them. He says, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? And then he encourages him again to watch and pray. And then it says in verse 39, again he went away and prayed. So we see the Lord pray, then he goes back, he wakes them up and he goes back to pray again. There's a consistency about the Lord's prayer, about the Lord's prayer life. We must be called as a people to be persistent, to, uh, be, uh, to show that importunity in our, in our prayer lives. Like, a, like an axe, uh, you know, if someone has a, uh, has a tree that they want to cut down, they take an axe and they go out into the garden and they give it a few whacks each day and then they go back in, and they come back out, and they whack that tree, and they go back in, they do that each day, and at some point that tree is going to come down. You have to keep seeking the Lord. Keep knocking at the door, and it will be opened. Keep asking, and it will be given unto you. You know that uh, picture that the Lord uses of the persistent widow in Luke 18? The widow who comes to the judge and says, give me justice for my adversaries. And the judge says, uh, he, get, he gave her this justice, lest, lest by her continual coming she wearies him. May we be a people who weary God in prayer, if I could put it like that. Obviously, he wants us to come to him. Uh, we can come to him through his son, Christ. But may we be a people who are consistent in our prayer life. If there's something the Lord's laid on your heart, maybe to pray for an unsaved family member. Maybe it's something at work, a problem that keeps reoccurring over and over. Maybe it's a character issue in your own life or the lives of those who are close to you. You know something needs to change. Deliverance needs to occur. There needs to be some progress. Let's just keep seeking the Lord. Go to him each day. Go to him with the same request. Go to him. He's calling for us to be persistent, to be importune, that we would go and continue consistently in our prayer life. You know... God is the God who hears the prayers of his people, but he doesn't always answer immediately. Sometimes there's, there's an element of faith where we must keep going and seeking his will over these things. May we be a people who pray deeply, consistently and deeply. We see, we see the Lord here in his prayer. <clears throat> 
Verse 36, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. That we would be a people that pray deeply. This word Abba is an Aramaic word for Father. Um, it's the everyday language that would have been spoken by, by Christ. Uh, it was a word that was used in Jewish culture by children uh, for their, to, to call their earthly fathers. Um, some, some claim that um, the word Abba is like uh, calling God Daddy, but that's quite, that's quite misleading. Uh, not overly appropriate in the context of the scriptures here either because even adults called their fathers Abba as well. It was a, a term um, uh, that was used amongst humans to call their human fathers. Um, but we see here the Lord use it and he addresses his heavenly father. Now this term Abba, it's not so much an immature way of addressing God but ultimately a term of expressing a warm authority. Authority, warmth and intimacy of a loving father and his care for his child. There was a heartfelt depth to Christ's prayer as he came to his father in the garden. This call from the depth of his soul, crying out to this one, this eternal father and son relationship that's existed from eternity past. Now here, Christ, the man, the God-man, comes, addresses his father as Abba, crying out from the depths of his very being. You know, I heard a preacher once say, God doesn't, God doesn't, necess God doesn't answer prayer, he answers desperate prayer. He answers prayers that come from the soul. Sometimes it's like one word, God, help me, help me here. Just to, just to seek in that, that prayer that comes out of the very depth, the core of our very being. We talk, don't we, about saying, have you said your prayers? Have we, said, we can say these things at dinner times and before bed and you know, it's, it becomes nothing less or more than just a ritual. But do we cry out to God from the core of who we are, the core of our very being, and knowing that we have a Father in heaven, an Abba Father who cares for us as his children? You know, no other, no other religion has that. You look at Islam, they have, they have got no understanding what's, whatsoever about this father relationship, about God being a father who cares for his children. It's nothing less than just cold, callous kind of religiosity. It's unrelational, there's no intimacy in false religion between the individual and, and the one true God. But praise God that he is a God that has that intimacy with his creatures. He has that intimacy with his, with his children. Romans 8.15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We've been adopted into the family of God. And then finally on this point of prayer, we must be watchful. We must be watchful. The Lord encourages them to watch and pray. Do you know in Luke 22, in this same conversation, just prior to, the Lord says, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And praise God that we have a saviour who is interceding for his people. Praise God that we have a saviour who said that no one can snatch us out of his hands. What a wonderful picture what a not just a picture what a wonderful reality that God is the God who holds on to us I heard a, a preacher once say you know if we, if we could lose our salvation we would because we fail so often but God is the one who holds us God is the one who keeps us in his hands and he calls his disciples to watch and pray why would he say that why would he call them to watch and to pray is it just because Judas is coming is it just because the Romans are coming He's already said to Peter that Satan has asked to sift him. There is a spiritual world that is out there and, and very real and, and often closer to home than we even realize. Paul, the Apostle Paul says, Our fight is not with flesh and blood, but with spiritual principalities and powers. See, Jesus and the disciples' problem here wasn't Judas and the Roman soldiers, but it's this demonic system that is governing and at work behind these powers that be. We need to be a people that are watchful. Have you, have you got that, you know, we talked about that humble insight at the start of the message. Do you understand that there, is, there are demonic forces out there 
that are seeking to steal the seed of the word from your heart, seeking to destroy you and your families, seeking to destroy churches that are preaching the gospel faithfully. There are real spiritual forces at work that we have to wage war with and we have to be watchful of. We have to guard the hearts and the eyes of our children. There is a system out there that, is what, that wants to swallow them up into hell. There is a system of this world that wants to destroy Christians, to destroy man mankind in general, and ultimately to attack the image bearers of God. We're called to be watchful. We're called to be aware of these schemes. We're not ignorant of the enemy's schemes. <clears throat> you know, it's no coincidence that one of the greatest attacks in the world today is on the family unit. You see that through TV. You see it through dysfunctional media that's basically trying to cause the family to uh, just to disintegrate. Husbands and wives getting divorces. Children are always often portrayed in these uh, TV shows as the, the authority in the house and then the fathers are, sh are shown as the fools. There's a complete distortion of what a biblical family should look like. And there's a reason for that because the devil knows that if he can destroy the family, then he can destroy a culture. And that is what he's doing in this world. He's, destroying, he's attempting to destroy families, to destroy true identity, what it means to be truly a man or a woman of God, and to destroy, ultimately, the end goal for him is the church, to destroy the culture, and then the culture is in full force against the church as it stands upon the word of God. We need to be a people who are aware of the enemy's schemes and watchful, you know, it's not, it's not, we need to be disciplined. There, there are times, you know, there's things that come on the TV, there's things that come, that, that decisions we may have to make where we have to just get away from it. We have to turn it off, say, well, that's not happening today. We need to turn it off. We need to go and do something different. We need to seek the Lord. You know, these are, this is for every family, really, between them and the Lord, your conscience on some of these issues. But if it's an issue of sin, the Bible says we're called to flee from it. You know, if we're, if we're finding ourselves being entertained with evil, entertained with things that Jesus died for on the cross, there's a problem with that. There's a problem with that. And I say that as, to me as much as any of us in here today. We need to be watchful. And it's only by being watchful. If we're asleep like those disciples in the garden and we wake up and the enemy's on us, it's only by being truly watchful that we can have the power to walk and the power to make those decisions and the discernment to understand truly what's going on with these things. <clears throat> so finally, let's just look ultimately at what, this, what is going on in this wrestle here with the Lord. <clears throat> he calls them to pray. And we see here this sacrifice that is being entered into by our Lord. He's in the garden. It's a moment of time. It's his final temptation, so to speak. And he's there. Firstly, firstly we see this willingness of the sacrifice. We spoke briefly earlier of this tremendous stress and pressure that the Lord would have been, in, un, uh, would have been under in the garden, having now approaching, approached his final hour He's finding his strength from above. The text tells us here that he was close to death. Have you ever known someone becomes, become under so much pressure and strain that they're close to death? The Son of God. He's, <clears throat> verse 35 and 36, he went a little farther and he fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for, me, for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Jesus, the perfect Son of God, always did the Father's will. Every word that came out of his mouth was in, was in obedience to his Father's will. Every time he didn't respond, it was in obedience to his Father's will. In John 6, Jesus said, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And we see here really this full identity of Christ, fully God and fully man, laid bare, perhaps more, perhaps more than anywhere else in any part of the scripture. We see Jesus the man throwing himself upon the ground, close to death, 
under the agony and the strain of what awaits him. Knowing all things, as we've already discussed, even predicting his resurrection. Knowing what was about to come. I've, I've shared this before these last few weeks. Jesus knew the price that was needed to be paid. We don't even, our minds, even as Christians, can't even get to the depths of the, the judgment that he took upon himself. But Jesus knew every last drop that he was going to have to drink down. He knew the price that he was going to have to, that was going to have to be paid for the souls of men. Now, most mere men would have run for their lives at this point. But not this man. Not this God-man, Jesus Christ. There was a, we see something that we haven't really witnessed in the Gospels in the same way up until this point. Jesus momentarily appealing to his Father that the hour may pass from him. Or in verse 36, that, that he would take this cup away from him. Take this cup away from him. We see in a sense here a tension. A tension, a struggle of two wills, so to speak. His human will and the divine will of God occurring. Not, not, that in any, not that Jesus in any way committed any sin. He, didn't, he wasn't rebelling in any way. He wasn't doubting or being sinful in any way here. But we get a glimpse of this momentary appeal to God his Father concerning the cup he was about to drink from and the possibility of it taking, being taken away from him. But then he follows up immediately, nevertheless, not my, not, not up my, but thy will be done. We know that there was a sense in which Satan was attempting to dissuade Jesus from going to the cross. As I mentioned earlier, he'd already spoken through Peter back several chapters earlier. And what did Jesus say? He said, you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. And he rebuked him as, as, as being satanic, remember? Jesus here momentarily appealed and then completely handed and yielded his own life over. Nevertheless, not, not my will, but yours be done. He completely yielded himself over as a willing sacrifice. He went to the cross willingly. You know, there's some evangelical leaders out there today that say, well, the substitutionary atonement... That makes God evil and it's this form of cosmic child abuse. It's cosmic child abuse. Jesus wouldn't have, uh, you know, have gone to the cross and, and, uh, and received his father's wrath upon himself because that would be, that would be evil. But they, don't, they fail to realize that Jesus willingly came. He willingly gave his life. It wasn't just he was doing something that he didn't want to do that the father was willing for him. But Jesus and the father, the son and the father are one. They were both willing to go through with this work. Christ ultimately laid down his life for us. Remember John chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus said, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. No one took Jesus' life from him, but he laid it down of his own will. For he has the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. And finally now, not only was Jesus offering a willing sacrifice, but it was a worthy sacrifice. So we have this great dilemma in Scripture. The greatest dilemma of all of the Scriptures throughout this book, if God is holy and righteous and just, how can a holy and righteous and just God forgive wicked sinners like us? That's the great dilemma. It's, called the, it's known often as the divine dilemma. And it's one of the reasons, one of the reasons mankind doesn't see their need for salvation is firstly they, they either don't understand how sinful they are or they don't understand how holy God is. And therefore the cross of Christ doesn't make any sense to the unbeliever. But there needed to be a sacrifice that was worthy and only God himself could provide that sacrifice that was worthy. For example, me and you, we couldn't take the wrath of God upon ourselves for other people. We haven't got the capacity to do that. Jesus Christ came, God in the flesh, and he took on the sins of his people, past, present and future. Thousands, thousands, millions of, of his saints from every tribe and tongue. And Christ went willingly, to that cross 
And in that garden he spoke of what he was to receive. He knew the price that was to be paid. And he knew, we see a a glimpse of him staring this cup of God's wrath directly in the face as the father is about to press it to his lips, so to speak. We know from the Old Testament, we know from the New Testament, the cup of God's wrath is poured out upon those who have sinned against him, those who are his rebels against him. And Jesus knew that that cup was going to, be, going to be poured out upon him, the cup of God's judgment that we deserve for our sin. You know, you look through church history and you see, you see saints many of which were martyred for their faith. There's a book called uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's not by any means light reading, but it speaks of these men and women that went to their deaths. Some of them burnt at the stake. Some of them uh, 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 decapitated and, 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 and killed in grotesque kind of ways. Many of these saints went to their deaths singing hymns to God with joy in their hearts, clapping their hands, singing to their Savior, their Creator, And here we see Jesus, the Son of God, under such immense pressure that he sweat drops of blood. He sweat blood. This is a real process. There's There's a real physical condition where people are under such intense stress, psychologically, physically, that blood begins to sweat through their pores, their sweat glands, under their arms, on their back, down their face. This is, there's been a handful of cases in the 20th, 20th century of this taking place. And we see Christ here. You mean to tell me that all those Christians in church history that went to their deaths singing hymns and clapping their hands, you, they're, they're braver than the captain of their salvation who's cowering in the garden, sweating blood almost unto death. The reason for this is because Christ knew what was in the cup. He knew what he was going to have to go through. And just a few hours later, that cup would be poured out upon him. The judgment of God, the Father's eternal wrath, was going to be poured out upon Christ because of our sin. The wrath that we should take, the eternal judgment of hell that should be poured out upon us, was poured out upon him in our place. This is is fundamental to the Christian message. This is the core of what Christ did at this cross, the substitutionary work of him receiving the punishment upon himself that he didn't deserve, but that we deserve, so that we can receive the righteousness and the grace of God that he merited, that he uh, completed, and that we don't deserve. It's so important to include the reality of Jesus' finished work in our gospel presentation. When you're sharing the the good news of people uh, at at work or in your family, speak to them about this price that was paid. Speak to them about this penalty that he took in in the place of those who would believe. Or maybe just a personal note before I come to a close. For, For much of my life, I considered myself to be a Christian. But it was always a question that kind of was there in the back of my mind. And how does a man dying on a cross make us right with God? How does that make us right with God? Well, you see, on that cross, the God-man, the perfect one, was made to be sin. He took the punishment that we deserve so that we could be legally acquitted of our guilt in the eyes of God, where, where wrath and mercy kissed and met as Jesus hung upon that cross and cried out, Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he said, it is finished. On that cross, Jesus completed that saving work. It's interesting, we think of Peter and how he denied the Lord, how he ran for his life. But then just a few weeks later, we see the power of the Spirit of God fall upon the church We see this one who denied Christ. He was reinstated. Peter, feed my sheep, teach my lambs. 
We see the Lord ask him, do you love me? Three times he was reinstated. What a wonderful, merciful God that we have. And you know, Peter actually, church history would tell us that he actually went to his death in the end for the Lord. So it actually did, it did happen in the end. He, be, he became a martyr, as did all of the other disciples except John. But we see this picture of the Lord being so gracious to his people. Even though they were asleep in the garden, he still uses weak vessels like us, weak individuals for his own glory. Maybe this morning, maybe this morning you've, you've not truly trusted Christ. Maybe you've not truly understood the work of the cross, the sacrifice that was paid. Maybe you're Maybe you have a Christianity which is more like a, I don't know, like a self-help kind of religious system. Has the work of Christ changed you inwardly? Has it, has, it give, has, it, has it done such a work as you've looked to Jesus and his death on the cross? Has it done such a, a work of power in you that you now know what it means to be born again, to be saved, to be set free from sin? Let's pray, shall we?